All right. Well, thank you, Trevor. And first off, thank you, Magmod, for doing all this for us. Hopefully, a lot of you have been checking out the booth today, uh, yesterday, and tomorrow. There's a ton of great people here, so please check out the schedule, come back. Uh, I think everybody's doing something a little bit different, which is really, really great. So hopefully, there's a little something for everybody during WPPI here. So today, I'm going to be talking about two things that are a little bit more unique, I think, to my particular area uh, that's going to be kind of popular trend-wise. Um, but I think that there are things that a lot of people have sometimes tried and struggled with. So hopefully I can kind of demystify and break down how I att attempt to do Dancing in the Clouds and Sparkler Exits. All right, so a little bit about me. I'm based in New York, Pennsylvania. It's kind of near, out near Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Amish country. Uh, I shot my first wedding back in 2013, and I was a former middle school special ed math teacher. That's what I did for 10 years. I actually just left last year. Anybody currently working a day job as well as photography? We just quit two years ago. I was a teacher, too. So I know a lot of people are in those. I know I never thought I would get there. You will get there. Keep working hard and pushing, and it'll definitely happen. So, uh, and I just went full time last year. So that was out in, for my 30th birthday in Vegas, actually, a few years ago. So I went skydiving if you've never done it. Awesome activity to do. My two cats, I'm obsessed with my cats. I love them dearly. And if you were here yesterday, Tanya Parada, she's one of our ambassadors as well. Uh, I got engaged last summer out in LA and she shot our proposal. So uh, yes, I, I use fellow Magmon ambassadors for my photos as well. And uh, Miguel O'Cake is actually shooting my wedding next month. So there you go. Keep it in the family. All right, so Dancing in the Clouds. A lot of people, you might not know what these look like. Uh, how many people have seen something like this before at a wedding? All right, only a few, okay. Um, in the Northeast where I am, it tends to be a popular thing for the big ballrooms. Um, tends to be, make it more grand, and the idea is that the couple is kind of dancing on top of these clouds here. So, the effect, a lot of people say, how is this effect done? And there's a lot of things I want to clarify about it to, in order to make sure that it turns out the right way. So, fog machines. A lot of people think that this is done with fog machines. It can be, but there's a big problem. The fog is gonna rise and it's going to engulf the entire couple. And it's not going to look like a really great first dance because all you're gonna see is a whole bunch of fog around them. So if you have anybody that's doing this, make sure they are not using a fog machine. What you need to use is dry ice. So it's a dry ice machine that produces all of that effect and it stays lower to the floor because of the chemical balance that it has. So that's the big difference between those two. Who provides it? It's kind of up to you. Uh, generally, most DJs do offer it. I know more DJs are adding it on these days as like a little sell-up option, and some venues even do it themselves. Um, so it might be something in your area, it might not, might not be, but I think it's something we might see more and more of in the future. All right, so one thing I wanna make sure that's very clear, when it comes to lighting, it's not my way or the highway. There are a million different ways to light things, so please, Take it as a grain of salt. If you think this works great for you, fantastic. If it doesn't, that's fine too. So I wanna talk about some different ways to go about doing this. You can get similar effects of like what I'm doing with just one flash. First thing you do, you expose for your ambient light, you add a flash onto your subjects, you can get a great photo just like that. If you wanna use two flashes, you could ex expose slightly under the ambient, one flash on the couple and one flash across the dance floor to light up the clouds. You can get a similar effect using that way. So there's really no right or wrong way to experiment. You know, just try things out, see what you prefer for your look. Um, there's not one way to do it, so make sure you try it yourself. And creating images like this, I think, is super easy once you kind of figure out what's working for you. So for example, I use the same reception lighting setup for this. I've been using it for like three or four years now. That's the exact same setup, I do it every single time, and I can pretty much do it in my sleep now. So once you find something that works for you, stick with it and keep using it. All right, so when it comes to dancing in the clouds, my personal preference, this is my lighting diagram here. So if I'm shooting down here, I have a three flash setup. So I have a flash here, a flash here, a flash here, and my couple would be in the middle there. So my settings, usually one two hundredth of a second, F4, ISO is gonna be anywhere from 1600 to 3200. Again, I wanna set my ambient first, and then I'll start turning on lights from there. So on camera, I usually do keep one on there just in case of emergencies, or if my light's not quite hitting them the way I want to, I'll make sure I turn that on for a little bit of fill. 
on my on camera, I have a quarter CTO, a mag sphere, and it's on very low power just to help fill in some shadows there. Because when you have off camera flashes coming in with low end grids, it can be a little bit harsh at times. The on camera is gonna help soften up those shadows a little bit. So my three off camera, every single light, I'm using an AD200, the very popular ones that we're all kind of using these days. They all have a quarter CTO, a mag grid, and they're all usually around one thirty second power. So usually I can go to those settings and that's usually gonna get me pretty darn close. So I do use the mag rings and mag shoes. They're one of the newer products with the mag box system. If you guys haven't checked them out, they make things super, super easy, okay? This is the mag shoe here. It really makes it easy for like an assistant to handhold it, or you sit this on top of a light stand and you can easily now change this around. It's so much easier than anything we've had before, and I'm very thankful we had that now. So I'm always shooting into two of the lights and the third light is illuminating the couple, meaning these two lights are gonna be my rim lights back there. They're gonna help give that little kick, they're gonna help light up the clouds. And this one right here, that's gonna be my main one that's lighting up my couple there. So that's kind of why I have my three lights set up there. And why do I do it? Flexibility, first off, I can move around my circle here and keep shooting into two different lights. It's a triangle light setup, which gives me a lot of consistency. So if I go over here all of a sudden and shoot this way, I'm still gonna have a very similar look. And that's really important when it comes to your lighting, because I'm sure how many people have tried before to shoot at a different angle and all of a sudden your lighting looks completely different, right? So that's why I'm a big fan of using three or sometimes even four lights because it's gonna give me more options and it's gonna give me more consistency when it comes to my look. All right, so this was one of the examples there. So this was one 200th F4 and ISO 1600. So you can see there's my flashes right back there. That's lighting up the cup for the couple from the back and it's helping light up all this fog right down there. And then my main light is lighting up the couple there. This one, very similar situation, just different colors. So we have a couple right here. There's one of my lights, there's the other, and the main one's right back behind me for that one there, okay? All right, so some of the tricks. These are things, if you're in the MagMod group, I've shared out these photos before, but I wanna talk about some of the little tricks that kind of separate you and help make these a little bit easier. So they are shot with a wide angle lens. I'm using a 16 to 35. Okay, that wide angle look gives that drama to it. And you need to get low, okay? Typically, I'm taking it, I have a Sony A9, I'm getting down low as I can, and that way I'm shooting with all of that fog right there in the front there. It makes you feel like you're actually in it. If you're standing up here, it's not gonna feel like it's in the clouds. You gotta get down low into it and shoot up. Question. Are, are you usually at 16 when you're shooting these? Usually at 16, but I'll vary it up. Like that's not gonna be the only shot they got. I'm gonna also zoom in and get some closer ones as well. Because I have a 24 Oh yeah. 24 enough? And 24 could certainly be enough. It all depends on the room setup of how big it is. You know, sometimes you can back up a lot and other places are a little bit tighter. So it all depends on that. Yes? you have to clean your lens filter after you do it? No, that's a great question. He said, do you need to clean your lens filter after you do it? And no, typically you're not gonna have any issues with that there. Uh, so shoot a lot. Um, I am someone who, uh, I did the two-man workshop. I don't know if you guys have probably heard of them. We shoot like crazy. We shoot a lot of stuff. Um, and basically the fog is gonna keep constantly changing on you. It's gonna keep moving around. And the machine will be pumping it out to the dance floor. And at times it might stop for a second because it needs to get some more going. And so you're gonna wanna keep shooting through that because it's gonna keep changing. And you don't wanna miss that moment where it's right at its peak time. So the, another question I get a lot is about these starburst effects. So if you look here, kind of a starburst effect, not too much, but a little bit. But right here, there is a starburst effect. And if you notice, I'm at F4. And a lot of people say, how do you get the starburst effect if you're at F4, right? So there's two different ways. You can close down your aperture, meaning like you could go F7.1, 9, something like that. Or you just kind of hope that you get the right angle. And honestly, that's what's happened with this one. When your lights, when you're shooting into them, if you hit it at just the right angle there, you will kind of get a little bit of a starburst effect. So uh, those are my lights, and then these are the venue lights back up here. So that's why there's so many of them. Yes? When you do this in video, you get requests for it. Uh, no, no. <laughs> All right, and... There we go. All right, so sparkler exits are another thing I want to take a little time to talk about here, by the way. Right. 
If you're ever going to be burned at the stake, bring sparklers because, hey, at least sparklers. Fun, right? Fun as you die, at least, right? So how many people are terrified of sparkler exits? Yeah, am I? Am I? Honestly, like, they, they scare me a little bit because, yeah, getting burned is not fun. And that is a serious risk. So they're fast paced. There are no do-overs. Sparklers burn for so long. Once they start getting lit, there is no stopping it. It is go time. You got to deliver. Fire, enough said, you get burned. Drunk people, lots of them, very, very drunk people. Zero control, good luck handling all of that yourself, and it's dark, which means you're gonna have focusing issues, okay? Those are all the things I typically think of when we hear about sparkler exits. So, how do we turn the chaos into something like this? So, this is my personal preference again. So my settings, and this is every time, I'm at 1 200th, F5.6 and ISO 1600 to 3200. I'm at F5.6 because I want to get more definition in those sparklers. And there's everybody can do it to their different taste. If you shoot more wide open, you're going to get the really blurry bokeh of sparklers in the background. And that's beautiful too. And that's a look that if that fits you, definitely go for that. For me, I really like being able to see a bit more of the sparklers actually coming off as it goes off there. So the main light is held by my assistant on a light stand. So it's like a monopod and they're holding it up on there. And my assistant stands on the outside of the guest and extends the light above the people. So like, let's say if you guys are my rows of people right here with sparklers, they're running on the outside of that group with the light. Okay. Or if it gets too tight, they're going to stand directly beside me. And as the couple's moving through the sparklers, we're both going to be backing up together. Okay. I'll show you how that looks a little bit different. On that light, on my main light, there's gonna be a quarter CTO, a mag grid, a mag sphere, and I'm probably around 132 second power. And then I'm also gonna have a rear light. So that's gonna be on a stand back behind the couple there. And it's gonna be angled up slightly. Quarter CTO, mag grid to control that spill on the ground. And then 132 second power there. All right, so this one. Again, my settings there, 1 200th, F5.6, ISO 3200. It was pitch dark outside. This was about 11 o'clock at night, but I wanted to make sure I had some ambient light from the venue in the background here. So you can see some of that from the venue there. So <clears throat> I wanted to show you guys a little behind the scenes here. So if you look really closely, so this is the uncropped version. This is the same exact photo, just uncropped here. So again, I'll go back here to there. So if you look very closely up here, there's my main light coming in right there. Because I know everybody always says they can't quite imagine how this is done. So my assistant is outside of the line of people that are right out there, and they're holding it up and above and bringing it down onto them there. That really helps control my light spill, because as you can see, I have very little spill around the couple there. And that's my ultimate goal. That way, the sparklers don't get faded out from my lights. And then if you look very closely, I know it's difficult to see, my stand is right back there. So you can actually see it in that photo. And then obviously that was a very quick Photoshop job to just remove that out right there. Okay. Nicole. Are they following your couple? Are they walking and following them? So this, yeah. So basically like I'm back here, they're there. So basically they're at like a middle point between the two of us there. Good question. Um, process of, say, a sparkler event. Were you there only 10 minutes, or was it still going on after that? Um, so, I mean, the whole thing is over in about 30, 45 seconds. 45 seconds. Because they only last so long. Um, so, you, yeah, you got to move very quickly. So there's a lot of prep to it, which I'm going to talk about the important steps to do beforehand to ensure that you're successful with this. <clears throat> All right, so there's another one. Uh, that one was at 1600 because there was a little bit more ambient light. <clears throat> yeah. One sec. There we go. So both of those were where my assistant was moving on the outside. This one is where my assistant was right next to me. Because if you look here, do you guys see how tight that line was right there? And behind it, there were literally walls for the venue. So there was nowhere else for us to go. We couldn't get outside the group. So we are literally, my whole team, we're side by side with each other and we're just moving back through the whole crowd of people there as we can. So as we do that there, we just keep moving back and we just keep shooting away at that. All right, so some of the tricks to pulling it off. 
The big thing to Sparkler exits is a lot of education beforehand. That is a huge part of it. And that's why I think a lot of people tend to struggle with it because their couples don't know what to expect. Venue doesn't know what to expect. Guests don't know what to expect. So here are some tips for you. First off, having an assistant that knows what they're doing is really helpful. If they've done it before, they will kind of have a general idea of what they're doing and that's gonna be a huge help for you. Um, I'll talk about the next part, um, educating your couple and the guests before a single sparkler is lit. So, I don't let anyone light a single sparkler until I know that everyone is out there, everybody's in position, my team's ready and the couple's ready. Because I can't tell you, the first few times I did them, the couple was usually like having a drink, chatting with a friend in the back, and the venue started sliding the sparklers, and I'm panicking because I know we only have 30 seconds to get the whole you know, couple through there. So that's something you want to make sure that you talk to them about. Because you need to do multiple passes so it gives you a few chances. Uh, basically, sparkler exits, I say, they're honestly kind of a crapshoot as to what you're going to get. You're going to nail a bunch, but you're going to miss a lot. I will say that I probably take about 250 photos per sparkler exit. Okay, that is how much I am shooting. My flashes are usually burning out by the end of it, okay? But because they are moving rapidly, my light's changing rapidly, they're moving through different areas, and my assistant might get tripped up at some point, and I need to know that, okay, those are gonna all be misses, and then to, once they recover and get back on it again, now I have some more keepers. So that's something that's really big. Don't just take a few. Keep shooting, keep shooting, and then you'll get a few keepers. Usually, out of that is 250, I might get five to 10 that I really truly like that had that right expression. So, and the other big thing, use 36 inch sparklers. They come in all different sizes. They're usually 12, 24, and 36. 36 sounds really, really long, and they are, but that usually gives you around a minute, okay? And that minute, every second is precious, absolutely precious when it comes to this. Because, honestly, you don't want to risk getting burned. That's what it comes down to. So I tell my couples, I will not do it unless you get the 36 inch sparklers because it's just too risky. I've had friends who got burned, I've been burned. So it's usually pretty safe. You usually can get out of it okay, but definitely make sure you have the longer sparklers. All right, questions? So do you bring a safety uh, first aid kit? <laughs> Good question. He said, do I bring a first aid kit or anything like that? Yes, or... or <laughs> I, I do, actually do have one in my car. Um, I've never gotten burned so badly that, like, you know, I needed, like, a first aid kit, but it was just kind of like a... It left a little scar for, like, a week or so, and then went away, thankfully. So, yes? Is it mostly speed lights that you're using, or are you using other types? So I'm using 8200s for everything. With and So they're basically more powerful speed light. They're usually, they have about two and a half times power. Um, let me see, I don't think we have, do we have any 8200s around by chance? Oh, there we go, perfect, thank you. So these are the 8200s here. So, so Godox, Flashpoint, they're all, they're all basically kind of the same thing. I recommend Flashpoint from Adorama because they're US based and they will back you up with warranties and any issues like that. So basically this is about two and a half times a regular speed light. So the reason I like this is because I'm shooting a lot because these situations are constantly changing. And because of that fact, a speed light, I'm gonna probably have to have it closer to around 1 8th power or 1 16th power, which means once I start hammering on a little bit, it's gonna overheat. And with that, it's gonna cause me to miss a lot of shots. So with this, I can keep it at a lower power, which means faster recycling time, which means I'm gonna have more chances to hopefully get a hit. So. How many batteries do you go through in a wedding? Nothing, these last a full wedding easily, easily. So they're like $300, um, and personally, these are worth every penny. Um, I only use speed lights for when I'm indoors um, for basic stuff, but receptions and everything that's moving really quickly, I love these because of the speed of them. Nicole? On camera with your dingus, do you feel that it's more reliable to use the trigger with video than it is the video? <laughs> All right, so she asks, is it, is it better is it better to use the trigger on camera, you said, right. instead of like a speed light on camera? So it depends. Um, I know some people have said they've had issues with triggering um, with that. I've had a few, but not too many. Um, generally, I am going to use a trigger on camera just because I feel like it's safer. Um, I always have an assistant with me for my weddings, so I will admit I'm a little spoiled in that sense. I know not everybody can afford to do that, but for me, it allows me to be very in the moment and just shooting while they worry about moving for all the lighting. So all I'm doing is directing them, saying, hey, this is looking good, or you need to go a little bit more left or right, 
and then they can make those adjustments while I focus on composing my next shot there. So, yes? Did you put a sphere on that one? So I have, for my setup, as always, a grid, a quarter CTO, and then sometimes a mag sphere. Sometimes not. Sometimes not. So like on my backlight for, if I go back for this, let me see how we're doing on time. Nope, oh, okay. So for, for these, all that is is a mag grid and a quarter CTO on my backlight there. Oh, the one that's right yeah, yep, that's my hair light right back there. And then on here, you can actually see the sphere right up there. Do you see the sphere coming out right up there? So that's two lights. So the ones, the ones right back there for the hair, and then that's my main light that's lighting up the couple right there. So, and there is a sphere on that one because I want it to spread a little bit. I want it to help soften up the light on their faces a little bit. Whereas the light behind there, I don't want it to spread. So I do want it to just spread and soften up a little bit on the couple there. So that's why I'm going to use it on the main light, but not the back light. And it softens the dress just like that? Yeah, honestly, that's not far off from my straight out of camera. That's just my preset applied to it. And then I, all I did was take out the light stand there. So yeah, from there to there, that's it. Yes? So the light that's on the because I always have people stand in front of me. Ah, so she said, what about when people block the speed light out back here? So before I start doing the sparkler exit, I'm talking to them about that. So I'll tell all the guests, like I, I, I used to be a teacher, so I turn on my teacher voice and say, hey guys, I need you to really listen, pay attention to this and nobody gets hurt here. And I said, I'm gonna have a light right here and I don't want you to go in front of that. I need you to keep to the sides there. And I also tell my couple, I actually usually walk my couple out in front of it then I let them go forward and walking. Because, let's be honest, a lot of our couples are a little tipsy by the end of the night, and the last thing I need is them tripping over my light stand right on their final exit. Like, that would be disastrous. So I always make sure I talk to them, come out here, and if you see in this patio here, that's pretty far back away from most of the people, and that way I can kind of make sure that nobody's gonna trip over it, and my assistant's keeping an eye on that too, of kind of making sure, yeah. What was that? Uh, about how high is it? It's usually around waist height or so, and then I'll tilt it up just a little bit because I wanted to make sure that it's hitting the hair light like it is with them right there. Because if it's a little bit too low, you're gonna get a hot spot around the center of their dress, and you're not gonna get that hair light quite as strong, so. Yes, sir. You have to be creative when they light it. Who lights it? Who lights it? Uh, so I always tell the couples, you need multiple people lighting. So generally I say like, you want six lighters, and have venue people and everything, you start on opposite ends, work your way in towards the middle there, and then have everybody help light themselves as well. So it's, it's really a team effort, and you really need a bunch of lighters, because you know, if they only have a few, it's going to start going out before you even have them all lit. Grace, question? <laughs> Hi. Any other questions, guys? I will be hanging around afterwards, by the way, because I don't want to take any time away from our good friend Dave Shea here. He's quite talented as well. All right. Well, thank you guys.